In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Holy God, mighty God, we, we adore you. We come to you in the fullest revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. We study this, this ancient prophet called Hosea, salvation is God, and we want to be saved by Jesus Christ. So bless this word to our hearts, and Lord, may we find frame, firm faith in you as we work our way through this great, exciting text. And Lord, we want to come back to you. So bless this word to our hearts, and may we find favor in thy sight. Glory to Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, it is now, and shall be. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. It is it is the start to be a good school year. We we're opening a lot. We opened four new Bible studies. Isn't that great? Wow. So the, the kids are studying the Word of God now, and uh, they want to. You know what's really great about it? They want they want to do it. I know you want it. Excellent. All right. All right. Now you. All right. We, we left that on Hosea six. When things really get bad, how many ever had an interesting? Discovery. When things really get bad, God is looking at you. Turn to the person and say, that means you. When the disciples were being tossed on their little boat experience on the Sea of Galilee, Jesus was all praying and watching them. He had to let them go through the storm. It was a very quick tour, but guess what happened? It took them seven hours to get a few miles because they were in a storm and they thought they were going to lose their life. So Jesus lets you go through that. And then he says to us in verse 1 of chapter 6, and everybody box 1 and 2 in because this is one of the greatest prophecies in the Bible on the resurrection. The Old Testament believes in the resurrection, but sometimes you gotta work your way through it. How many ever heard of the book of Exodus? Yes. I, I gotta, I gotta do this, and um, I'm, I'm teaching fourth grade now. The way they say the books of the Bible, absolutely hysterical. <laughs> It'll go viral and get three million hits by tomorrow morning. Exodus. Light about it. Light about it. I mean, the names that come out of them are precious. So I'm going to tape them, and then you got to you got to see you got to. See. It's absolutely hysterical. So um, if if you box it in in the book of Exodus, we find when Jesus, when God reveals Himself, I am who I am. Exodus three fourteen. He says that I am God of the God of the living of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And when God says, I'm uh, the, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God can only put his name next to somebody who's alive. Whoa. Did you get that? Yes. What did the Jews, uh, who, who are the big three? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You, God can never put his name next to a dead person. So, but they were already, in Exodus, they were already... Uh, and so God says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So there's, there's an account uh, of the... Uh, Deuteronomy 31, 16 is another account when God says that there'll be a revival. Perhaps the clearest one of all is Isaiah 26, 19, which we looked at last time. Isaiah 26, 19. It talks about the resurrection. Okay, how many know everybody here is going to be resurrected? Some of you, it may not fare well. Amen. In 2619, everybody will be resurrected. John 5, from those, some will be saved and some will be damned. Then um, another Old Testament, I'm giving you Old Testaments tonight, of the resurrection is in Psalm 1610. In Psalm 1610, God says these words to us. It's about Jesus in the grave. As soon as he goes into the grave, does everybody know this? As soon as Jesus' body was placed in the grave, what happened to his body? It started regenerating. It didn't go toward death. It went toward life. It started going the other way. So what happened to all of his wounds on the body? They all started disappearing. 
But God in his goodness allowed the wounds to stay here, here, on his side and in his feet. You will see that one day. How many are excited that you're gonna see that? And so in the so we see that's Psalm 16, 10. Psalm 6, I will not let my holy one undergo corruption. And then the other Old Testament um, is the Catholic book of Maccabees. Chapter 12, verse 48. Second Maccabees 12, 48, where it says, it is good to pray for the dead that they may be released from their sins. This is where you get the Old Testament understanding of purgatory. Anybody ever hear purgatory before? Yes. Now, Catholics ask the question, do, do Catholics have to believe in purgatory? Yes. Does Phil believe in purgatory? Never mentions it to me, ever. But you must believe, if, you're, if you want to be a Catholic, there is a real purgatory. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. So there is a real purgatory. Where's that in the Bible? Really quick, 1 Corinthians 3, 11 to 16. Next, we can see that uh, in the Old Testament, there's another idea of the resurrection. In Daniel 12, Daniel chapter 12. Now, we, we could fill tonight doing a whole study on the resurrection, which wouldn't be a, a bad idea. So does everybody know, the moment you die, review, you know whether you're going. Ma'am, you know where you're going. Ma'am. 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 You know where you're going. You're going either to glory or the cooker. In fact, the kids will say to me, did you mean the cooker? I said, yeah. <laughs> the cooker, amen. So all the kids know there is a real cooker. And so they said they'll never work for UPS for the rest of their life. Oh. Okay, so... So uh, there is a real heaven and there is a real heaven. The moment you die, the, that's called the partial judgment. When you, are, when you go through the partial judgment, you will be placed in a place, I, I call it um, he heaven suburbs, because you did not get your resurrected body yet. You do not get your resurrected body until we all stand in front of God called the general resurrection, John 5. We're all going to stand in front of God. General resurrection. General resurrection. Then you're going to see the separation of the sheep and the goats. Matthew 25. That's called the final. That's the final. The final, ma'am. The final. Okay. I know. And now, every believer goes before the Bema seat. Romans 14, 10. Every unbeliever goes before the white throne judgment when he says, I never knew you. Okay? So, and then what's going to happen at the end of time, when Jesus comes in the second coming, purgatory is totally gone, gone. Totally gone. And then you get a brand new body. How many want a brand new body right about yeah. now? Yeah. Turn to the person next to you, you need a new body right now. <laughs> So you get a brand new body. So that, that's, that's just a quick review of what we believe, okay? So um, Jesus is coming. When he comes, we start to get those brand new... The word resurrection, again, literally means stand up. Because life knocks you down. Now everybody here, ma'am, everybody here has to stand by themselves in front of God and given a whole account of your life, ma'am. A whole account of your life. Amen. <laughs> and everything you said and did, if you have confessed sin, you do not have to give an account of that. So what should you do every night? Confess, Confess it. You don't have to give an account of it. Is that good? Yes. When I had the nuns, remember with the holy sisters, they always told me one thing before I go to bed. Ask God to forgive you of the day's activities that were not good and sinful. Amen? Amen? So you are forgiven. So you don't have to give an account of your life before God for confessed sin. Good stuff? Good stuff. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 12. <laughs> Hebrews, chapter, <laughs> Hebrews chapter 8, verse 12. 
And then, then when we get after we're judged on the day, it's called in, in the prophets the day. We would say yom, y o m, the day. After we go through the day, then we're ushered into glory. You get your brand new bodies. When you get your brand new body, First John chapter three, it's exactly like Jesus as he rose from the dead, in that same power and might. So, how many like a body like that? When you get your brand new bodies, this is a long explanation. You'll be able to walk through walls. Your mother always wanted to send you through one. You'll be able to walk through one. Amen. You'll be able to walk through the walls. You'll be able to be, number two, you'll be able to be in one place instantly and another. Thirdly, you will have impassibility, which means you'll never suffer. You will never be depressed and you won't be hungry anymore. And then you reign with Jesus forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. You got the picture? All right, that's a long explanation. So the word resurrection means stand up. Why do you got to stand up? Because you got to go in front of a judge. Okay, verse 1. Chapter 6 of Hosea. Come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us to pieces, but he will heal us. We've been ripped. Remember, remember the prophets say, this is called being raised. R-A-Z-E. Everybody say raised. raised. Do we use that word a lot? No. How do you say that in Korean? You got to be raised. Do they use that word raised? Raised means utterly destroyed. You got to be utterly destroyed. And, and then God can take it. As Job would say, chapter 19, verse 23. My life, I will stand on the ashes of life. My eyes, not another's, will see God. Job 19, 23. And, and it's, a great, it's a great Bible verse when you want to plan your funeral mass with Liz Kanapka. Okay? Well, you already got your scripture planned out. So just that you're going to stand on, on the very threshold of your ashes. Amen? I was just thinking of my uh, burying my mother and where she was buried, she stood there uh, years ago, because, as she was uh, burying my father. He has torn to peace, he will heal us. Now, put in there, Holy Saturday. Put in there, Holy Saturday. Everybody remember Holy Saturday? Holy Saturday? So, what happens on Holy Saturday? Jesus is in the what? Great. Great. Does everybody know what happened on Holy Saturday? Jesus dies on the cross, he goes into the grave, and what happens on Holy Saturday? He's working. He goes all the way down to Sheol. Let's see all the UPS drivers down there. He goes all the way down. He goes all the way down. He goes to Sheol. And there was every known person who lived prior to his death on the cross. He preached there, 1 Peter 3, 18 and 19. He preached there... And there is a Catholic belief, it's really a beautiful Catholic belief, that St. Joseph was all over, already mm -hmm. found in the corner. And Jesus went to him first. It's a Catholic belief, it, it's not in the Bible. It says, come on, l let's go now. Let's go, amen? amen. So it takes him and, and then it says in, in Matthew 27, 51. Matthew 27, 51. As soon as Jesus did that, the rocks began to shake. There was an earthquake. And when you go to Israel with me, we'll show you the crack. And Bishop Saratelli said something, and I was shocked that he said it, because the Protestants have always said it when he said it. I'm like, wow. He said what happened is the blood of the Lamb ran all the way down into the ground through Calvary, and it caused the whole rocks to split. Mm. When we go at the bottom of Calvary, you're going to see where the blood of the lamb just broke open the rock. Did you take a picture of that, sir? Mm -hmm. All right, and he's got a picture of, of that. All right, so now he can point out and say, the blood of the lamb went there, okay? Mm -hmm. And so bad was the earthquake, it went all the way, they felt it in Rome. Wow. wow. They straight felt down. it straight across, mm -hmm. underneath the Mediterranean mm -hmm. Sea, right in Rome. Mm -hmm. So when Jesus really did a shaking, didn't he? So now, look what happened on Holy Saturday. It's a healing day. Then he says to us here, um, he has injured us and he will bind up our wounds. How many are, are, are wounded? 
Now, when you, when you sin, how many know you're really wounded? Right? Anybody here wounded? Yes. Everybody here, shake your head. Yes, we are all wounded. And then he says, put a big star there by verse number, verse number uh, two. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will restore us. Everybody underline the third day there. There's the resurrection. He will restore us. Now, here's what it means to restore. To restore means to take brokenness and make it like nothing has ever happened, that you can't see the difference where your brokenness was. How many would like to have that kind of healing from the Lord right now? And that's what kind of healing Jesus offers right now. You can get that kind of healing, amen? amen. Galatians 6, verse one and two. That's how we are to restore people. How many would like to restore every single person in this room right now? That everybody here knows what everything that they've done is totally restored. That everything about their bad history is totally gone. That they are so brand new that they could do cartwheels in the parking lot. How many would like to have that kind of brand new start? Guess what? It's yours tonight, okay? How many want to do the, the kids tell me to do the, the floss dance, okay? So how many want to really rejoice? That's what God offers you. That's resurrection. Now underline the word third day. Now, I want you to notice something for the rest of your life. So I'm giving you homework. Be very close attention to all the third days mentioned in the Bible. For example, let me give you another. They're all connected. And I was going to do, I was going to do a, a, a book called, but someone didn't help me yet. I was, going to do, I was going to do a book on the third day, the meaning just the third day. And one of the third days that's very when Avram is walking, Yitzhak, Abraham and Isaac are walking up the mountain. Yes. What day was it? The third day when they started out. The third day. Are you getting some good stuff here? Okay. So every time you read the third day, you know something magnificent is going to happen. But he will bind up, he will restore us that we may live in his presence. Now, if you underline the word presence there, it's more the glory of God. What, what do your Bibles have for that one? Presence. Presence? Before okay. Him. Before him. I like the word presence better. Amen. Now remember there are two presences of God. One is in the Bible. Another one is not. The outside change of your life is called Shekinah. Spell it. The inside of God working on you is called Kabod. Spell it. Spell it. <laughs> Shekinah. S H E K I N A H. Everybody says Shekinah. Shekinah. Now, what is a Shekinah? When you walk around, and how many have ever seen people, they just glow with Jesus? Anybody ever see that? Oh, Avon? Well, the name's got to go. But uh, <laughs> they just walk around with Shekinah. That comes from the inside called a kabod. And that's the true glory. Okay? Can you spell that one? Uh, spell that one. K-A-B-O-D. Kabod. So Jesus, when you are changed, you have a Shekinah. Because it comes from his kabod inside of you. Okay, now when we go to heaven, everybody planning to go? Yes. Send in your RSVP. Yes. When you go, you gotta, you gotta sign up for Kabod. You'll be always living in the Kabod when you go to heaven. And when we visit each other, you don't even have to knock, you just walk right through. And you say, oh, it's Grace, because she changed her name finally. <laughs> Amen. She'll walk through. I know that I know that I know that I know that when she goes to glory, she will not have the name of a woman. <laughs> Amen. We will all be given name. Her name means mortal, mortal, mortal sin. <laughs> now, do you, do you see why I'm trying to k kindly direct? Okay, amen. <laughs> Next step, so verse 3. Let us acknowledge the Lord. Let us press on to acknowledge Him. So now, the greatest way you can acknowledge God... How many would like to acknowledge God? One thing great my mother always taught me, she says, please acknowledge people. Acknowledge them. People in this room love to be acknowledged. Shake your head, yes. 
We just love to be. This past Friday, we had a healing mass. Do you remember, ma'am? There was a woman I was told there, a good friend of ours. She was dying of cancer. The doctor says she has three months to live. So we prayed over her, and the whole place was breaking out and crying. And she was doing cockroaches. Okay. <laughs> and then she, she went out and did the floor stance in the parking lot. Right? She looked pretty good out in the parking lot. She looked great. Okay. So uh, we got to acknowledge one another. Amen. So now, what does it mean to acknowledge? Now, this is really good. Now, draw an arrow there from verse number three. Put it back into verse number two. You can only acknowledge God. You ready? How many want to acknowledge God? You acknowledge God when you believe He raises people from the dead. You acknowledge God when you believe He raises people from the dead. Okay, remember your son being raised from the dead? You can, oh, now, let me, give, let me give you scripture on that. In Ezekiel 37, dead bones gonna rise again. Remember those dead bones? And God says, when you see these dead bones, and that was the house of Israel, dead in sin. When you see them coming alive in the spirit, you, then the world will know that I am God. So how do you acknowledge God? You've got to believe he raises people from the dead. Amen? Amen. So turn to the person next to you and say, dead bones are going to rise. Dead bones are going to rise. Dead bones. Dead bones are going to rise again. Amen? Now when you do that, you're going to say, I, I was doing a conference and there was a little boy at the conference and I was just preaching on dead bones are going to rise again. That he heard me at the conference and he thought that was the funniest thing. He's <laughs> so one little boy said to the other little boy, he says, I'm practicing. A little, uh, you know how kids are. So he says to the little boy, lay down. <laughs> so the kid lays on the floor and he says, dead bones are going to rise. <laughs> so, I mean, you, you can't make this stuff up. You, now, acknowledging God is believing. Now watch this. I'm giving you good stuff here. Acknowledging God is believing he, he, those dead bones are coming alive. Amen? So say you have your son living with you. You just go into his room and say, dead bones are going to rise. But sometimes you've got to get, get aggressive. Amen. And dead bones are going to rise again. Amen. You, you got that? So you got that when the UPS driver is coming? Dead bones. Now when you acknowledge that, then God is seen through you as the greatest thing he could do for us is raise people from the dead. Now, just to remind you, Jesus raised, as we know, this is, in fact, he, he raised three people, as we know, probably could have done a lot more, of course, three people from the dead. Now, the pe three people he raised from the dead, they were de different levels of dead. One just died, he said, Talitha kume. My little lamb, get up. Number two, they were carrying him out at the gate in Nain, Luke 7. And he said, stop in the name of love. And he, he's, he brought the person back from the dead. Third, Lazarus was dead for four days and Irma was crawling inside of the grave. <laughs> you can't believe the things that I have seen. And Peter says, Irma, smile, picture, come on. I mean, you you got to get this. There's, she's standing in a grave, and Peter wants a picture of a woman standing in a grave. You, just can't, you cannot make this stuff up. So, Jesus raised three people from the dead. One that just died, one that was being carried out, and one was dead for four days. So now, what's the greatest acknowledgement? Say, anybody have a problem here? Nobody. Anybody ever have a sin here? Everybody. Okay. <laughs> okay, now when you have a sin, what do you got to do? You got to acknowledge it. And then when you acknowledge it, God gets the <coughs> glory. Amen. Are, are you following with me? This is good stuff. When you do that, brothers and sisters, you're raising from the dead. Good stuff? Let us press on to acknowledge him as surely as the sun rises, he will appear. Okay, if you underline that. Now, God always wants to, what, what does God do the best? Well, everything, of course. 
But for us, what is the best? My sins are gone. So he's going to make an appearance. So if you're, everybody right in there, the incarnation, he will appear. He will show his glory. Amen? Amen. The prophet Malachi, or Malachi, says the sunbeam will be on his wings. Now, when you go to Malachi 3 and 4, it says when God appears, he'll be in glory. How many remember the transfiguration? Yes. Some of us want us to skip the transfiguration in the Holy Land. Yeah. Because we've already seen it so much. But yeah. someone has not come all those other times. And probably would like. And when I take this first person up to, our, to the table, I'm going to say, look, Miss Pat, look at Armageddon. <laughs> I'm trying to scare her a little bit. It's not working. She just keeps smiling. And, and then, so what happens that he will appear. So if you, if you circle that, he, he will appear. There, that comes that what? That glory. Amen? He will appear. He will come to us like the winter rains and the spring rains that water the earth. This is really great. Oh, let me do the happy dance on this. Now this is called the rains and the latter rains. The rains and the latter rains. When the Holy Spirit comes, we sing a song in Pentecostalism called the rains. When I, I was with the Caribbeans last week. We had a lot of rain songs, and it was raining, too. Yeah. And so when you're with the Caribbeans, um, it was pouring rain. And I'm saying, let it rain, let it rain. I said, it's already outside. Just step right outside. It will rain you. The rain represents growth. I've been asking the Lord for years. I, I keep reading a passage in the Psalms about getting corn. I said, God, why corn? I like corn. Do you like corn? And it, wasn't, it doesn't mean the corn, that the yellow stuff that you eat, New Jersey variety. The corn means, on a corn, they have all these tiny little what? Kernels. Kernels, right. It means the multitudinous abundance of... Next time you eat a corn, not the ones on your toes, but the next time you eat a corn, next time you eat a corn, count how many kernels you're eating. That's the multiplication of the grain. So God wants to give you, when you eat a corn, it means multiplication, it means fertility, it means life in the spirit. Amen? So now, it keeps on restoring, right. Very good. Now, so in Israel, there are two rains. By the way, it hasn't rained there in six years right now. Remember with Elijah? Three and a half years. So they're already beyond Elijah right now. Now, here's really scary news to tell you. It hasn't rained in six years. And they plugged, Jordan plugged in water into the Dead Sea, and uh, Israel plugged water into the Dead Sea. So they're going, and what are they doing with the Dead Sea water? Well, they got the taking out the salt factories, right? Uh, and then what are they doing to the Jordan River? And it's. So. You're going to see the Jordan River. Pretty soon we'll be able to walk over to Jordan. And then when you look at the Sea of Galilee, islands are forming there right now. As everything is drying up. Amen? Now, Israel needs rain. I hope it doesn't come when we start to get there. Okay. okay. So usually, when we, the first day we arrived last time, it was raining. It was cold, it was chilly. I saw, it was so cold, I saw a chicken with a cape on. It was so cold. Amen. So, um, there are two rains. One is around Passover. The second rain is around um, October. So it's called the rain and the latter rain. Now, Israel is supposed to be the land with milk and honey, honey. But God says, so abundant is Israel, I'm sending two mighty rains. Mm -hmm. Now Jesus uses a reference in Matthew 5 and verse 44 to 48. It rains on the just and on the unjust. If you put a circle on rain there, rain is always seen as good. Tov, T-O-V. Okay, unless you have 40 days of it, you got a problem. Okay, so it's seen as good. But now here, from the prophet Joel, we need a latter rain. Now, spiritually speaking, what does that mean? 
we've had a the body of Christ. We have all experienced great things of God in this room, haven't we? Shake your head, yes. Things are getting kind of a little dark today. But how many know we need a latter rain? A latter rain. That another outpouring of what God is sending down to us. So everybody underline there in your Bibles, verse number three, the spring rains that water the earth. So we have the latter rains is October. The, the, the spring rains come when? Passover. Do you, do you see the two in there? Now, how many remember Jesus standing on the steps? John 7, 37. He's standing on the steps. And in John chapter 7, 37, he says the Holy Spirit will come out. And also he says in John chapter 10, he says uh, the greatest... How many know Hanukkah is mentioned in the New Testament? Does everybody know that? Yeah. Now, the problem is you're not going to read the word Hanukkah. But what was Jesus celebrating? Hanukkah. The Feast of the Dedication. The of the dedication. And that's in John chapter 10. And when, when, you, when, you, when you, God brings us back to restoration, you've got to celebrate another Sukkoth, making it to the other side. So in the month, by the way, Hanukkah is called the Jewish month of cheese lev. C-H-I-S-L-E-V, cheese lev. What they did was when they celebrate their new life back, they celebrate a new rain coming. They got the abundance. Now, how many ever heard of Jesus saying to you? Anybody ever hear Jesus saying to you, I give you life, life abundantly. Does everybody know what he means by that? I'm giving you the new rain. I'm letting it rain so that you have all of your proper things. Then you can eat your corn and then it will continue to be multiplied. When we're walking with God, everybody here who's his son and daughter, are you all sons and daughters? Yes. He will multiply the grain for you. And what is grain a sign of? Pentecost. What did they do on Pentecost? They broke the, the, the top of the trees and they waved them in the air. Okay, amen? It's called the in-gathering. What did the Jews do for Pentecost? Bringing in the sheaves, bringing... Now, what do we do on Pentecost? We should be bringing in the people to be redeemed by Jesus Christ. Amen? I was walking through the school today, and I'm picking up kids to be baptized. They're on the Father Bill baptism bus. <laughs> so I want to get all of my kids baptized. Amen? So we, we picked up two today that are going to be baptized at the Easter vigil. Amen? You never, nobody here brought me anybody, so you're all getting attacked. But anyway, I have to go on my own and get the kids into the kingdom. Amen? Okay? Yes, ma'am? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Good stuff? Good stuff. Now, verse 4. What can I do with you, Ephraim? Now, Ephraim means, remember I told you it's the center section? I'll, I'll write it on the board here. Here's Jerusalem. Over here is Benjamin, where the whole... Ben, the tribe of Benjamin took over um, Jerusalem. And the center section is Ephraim. It's approximately three, four, five miles from Jerusalem. We're going there. Most tours never go there. Your camera will be ready, sir. We are taking you into spots. And you, sir, are going to talk to the locals and tell us what happened in Ephraim. Because Jesus was definitely there. So we're going to pick up some local stories not in the Bible. So I, I can't wait to hear what they're going to say. And you know what? I would kind of believe them. I would kind of believe them about the stories they're going to tell us about Jesus. I can't wait. After 2,000 years, I'm going to find out something new about Jesus. Amen. So Ephraim is, oh, now becomes a symbol for the north of it, called Israel and the south called Judah. So what do they do is, here's the north, here's the south of Israel, so let's give it another name, Ephraim. Because it's the centerpiece. Everybody follow? So now what does he say there? Come back to me. What can I do with you, Ephraim? How long have I known you? How many ever heard Jesus say that? 
Okay. Did, did you ever hear anybody say that one before? How long have you been wi living in western Jersey with snakes coming in your basement? How long? One. How one. long? Vacation. Okay. Does that sound familiar? Luke 18. When I come back to Parlin, will I find faith on earth? When I come back to Edison, will I find faith? When I come back to Hasbrook Heights and Woodridge and all those areas with no rug on the floor, will I find faith on earth? Amen? So will I so what would be a synonym would be Ephraim? What have I to do with you? Where are you? So what can I do with you, Judah? Now Judah is the what? South. Your love is like the morning mist, like the dew that disappears. You say you're going to follow God and it's a mist. What happens to the mist? How many remember the dew? Do you see any dew anymore? Yeah. Oh, you're always yeah. in bed all the time. Yeah. Okay. You, you got some dew in the morning? Yeah. By the way, the dew, if you circle the word dew there, the, that's how God watered the earth before it began to rain with Noah's flood. Now, dew is also a reference to the Holy Spirit. Anybody up to see the dew in the morning or feel the dew on the grass? Yes. Now that's how God watered everything. There was no rain. There was no rain. The first rain. So imagine with Noah and the ark when all of a sudden the, God shut the door and all of a sudden it started to rain. When it started to rain, they got a little scared because liquid was coming from above. And here's what another reason they got us scared. Because the Jewish people believe, from orthodoxy, they believe it was hot. It was boiling water. So how many would, only, only eight people got inside, and how many would like to have boiling water over you? You got the picture? Amen? So if you circle the word do there, it's refreshment. Now most priests choose prayer two when you do the Eucharistic prayer, and they use the word, and you were having a problem with that, man. Do, D-E-W. So the do is a new refreshment. Remember the spring rain and the latter rain. Amen? Look at verse number five. Therefore I cut you in pieces with my prophets. I kill you with the words of my mouth. Now you're, everybody is responsible for this book. There's dust on it. Say you sit all the way in the back of this group. You are responsible for this book. See the pages? But I don't understand it. When are you going to understand it? See this book? You're responsible for it. Amen? Now, if you don't follow what's in here, what's going to happen to you? You're going to perish. You're going to be cut. A fourth grader comes up to me yesterday and he says, she said, she, you, very perceptive fourth grader, you said Jesus is the way, truth, and life. I said, yes. <laughs> she said, what about, I couldn't believe a fourth grader said this, what about people of other religions? <laughs> and uh, so I just said, I smiled at her, and I just said, Jesus is after them too. And I walked away real quick. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I can figure she has a Muslim father or something like that, and so I'm saying Jesus is is going to, is after them. Perfect. So at a fourth grade level, yeah. now I had to be truthful, but yet uh, yeah. I, I just, mommy, all the blame. And I said, oh, I'm not going there. So so I had to answer the fourth grade truthfully. I have a way. If you have tough questions, I'll give you the answers. How to answer people and run. <laughs> Verse 5, I killed you with the words of the prophets of my mouth. Now, what is a mouth seen as in Hebrews 4.12? It's a sword. Yes, too much. Now, it's a two-edged sword. Look at a scissors. One of the blades go this way and one of the blades go that way. Have you noticed what a scissor does? One pierces you in your heart and the other one knocks off the enemy. One gets you and the other now. What happens if you don't respond? You got two blades in you. So 
if you don't listen to the words of the prophets, you're going to die. What do your Bible say to kill? Does your Bible say killer? I'm using a different verse. Slow. Slow. All right, kill. Yeah, okay. You're, you're, you're going to be dead in meat, amen? Then my judgments go forth like the sun. And what, why is that a bad name, the sun? Because the sun is what? Ha, ha, ha. The reason I want to go to Israel in January, it's cooler. Some people say, oh, I can't wait to go to Israel. I said, when you go in July? I said, hot as hell, baby. Hot as hell. I'm not going in July. I, am, I, I can't stand the heat. I, I, I may, I melt. <laughs> yes, I melt. So I can't, I can't go to Israel in July. Amen. So now the sun is seen as bad because it's very what? Hot. Are, are you getting these connections here? Verse number six. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. Now, a lot of people even here think you can win your way to God. You can't earn your way to heaven. Does everybody believe, know that? Now, very important, everybody underline the word mercy there. Mer, mer, mer. What was the name of one of Hosea's children? No. No mercy. Okay, amen? No mercy, remember? Remember the three kids? No mercy, no what? Uh, uh, not my people, not my people, no mercy. And Jezreel scattered all over the place. Remember, remember the name of those kids? Mm -hmm. You forgot them already, huh? So right here we have, brothers and sisters, we have uh, mercy. Write it in the word hesed. H E S E D. H E S E D. Everybody say Chesed. All right, now, when is the first time ever that God showed us his mercy? Exodus 32 with the golden calf. Do you remember the golden calf? Let me give you God's mercy definition by himself. Exodus 34, verse 6, 7, and 8. Okay? Okay, everybody go to Exodus 34, 6, 7, and 8. Exodus 34, verses 6, 7, and 8. Exodus 34. Now, you can only meet God in one place. Where can you meet God? Mercy. In mercy. Now, what is my favorite word every day? Mercy. Uh, you know how many times I say that every day? A lot. Amen. 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 Mer uh, do you, uh, Irma, do you ever say that word? All the time. I ever say that All word. the time. Did you find it? Now look at 34. You should have this line underlined for 6, 7, and 8. Everybody see that there? Now, here's, here's your test. I, I told you once before that in those verses, it's kind of hard to get it though. Peter, give anybody who can do it $100. Now, in those verses, there are 13 attributes of God. Can you find all 13? And it's not easy to find them all, okay? So, there are 13 in there. 13 attributes of the mercy of God, okay? Here's what he says. Everybody with me? This is the first time God reveals His mercy to us. Now, what do we do right now? We live in the mercy of God. Through St. Faustina, we have a Sunday called Divine Mercy Divine Sunday. Divine and by the way, just for the by the way of the by and the way, it must be celebrated in every church every year until the end of time. But would you know that in most churches today? Mm. Yeah. Oh, it must be celebrated. Amen. Mm. Yeah. The Lord, the Lord, everybody with me, verse 6? Yes. The compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger. I told them, Lord. <laughs> Slow to anger. Abounding in love, chesed, and faithfulness. Maintaining love to thousands. Now, the maintaining of the love to thousands means literally to the end of time. Because in the Bible, 
this is the highest number you can go to, thousand. So that means a forever. And he says there, forgiving wickedness and rebellion and sin. Those are the levels of sin. When you keep committing a sin, did anybody here ever commit a sin twice? Mm -hmm. Yes. When you commit it three and four times, you start to form a habit. When you commit it four, five, six times, you start to become rebellious. So when you have interesting people living with you, you want them to go to church, you want them back to God, but they keep doing the same thing all the time. They have become rebellious. And they have what is called the next level, which is very dangerous, a hard heart. If they have a hard heart, it's very difficult to be saved. Who had the hard heart? Pharaoh. Okay? So, if you box it in there, verse 6, 7, and 8, uh, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. What does that mean? That means you are going to look at your kids and you're going to be alive to watch your children, your grandchildren, and your great-grandchildren not follow God. And how many know some of you are living through that right now? My grandchildren aren't baptized. And then you're getting older, and then great-grandchildren. They're not being married in the church. Anybody see those things before? And they want a destiny wedding on the beach and have everybody take off their shoes <laughs> and have sand run between your toes. Amen? Amen? So we can see, we can see that's the first occasion. Now here's what, here's, let me give you some more background on that. When God gives his people mercy, he takes off his hiddenness to reveal himself to us. How many would really like to see God? You can begin to see God, Exodus 25, 40. You begin to see God only in mercy. If you really want to see Jesus today, it's mercy. That's why I love our image of the sacred heart. Image, mercy. So, what does Hosea say? Come back to me. I, I know you love my singing. I'm doing, I'm doing a... So, back with me to ex, uh, Hosea 6. Underline that there. You gotta, I desire mercy. Now, you're all going to be judged. Does everybody know your judgment day, what it's going to be about? Luke 6, 36. You, here's your judgment day. Your judgment day is how much mercy you gave everybody here. So how many want a lot of mercy on that day? A lot of mercy. Do you just love everybody? Did you invite your boss over for dinner? Okay. And remember, if you have mercy, you can never bring up anybody's sin. Everybody passing? Okay, now on your judgment day, that's how you're going to be judged. The mercy you give is the mercy you get. Amen? I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. Now, let's go through this. You want mercy? Yes. Now, not sacrifice. So what did the Jews do back then? Remember, what, what, what was in existence then? The first temple. So what did they do? Bah, bah, bah. They, they, took the, they took the lamp. Look, I offered the sacrifice to you. The next one comes in. Bah, bah. And what happens for most people, they feel they go to a church on Sunday and that's it for God for the week. Yes? So what are they doing? They're going through a sacrifice, so to speak. I don't want that. Oh, I'm not saying don't go to church. Absolutely, we go to church. But he wants mercy. Now, Jesus said that this way in Matthew 11. I want mercy. I have come to call those who are sick O's. How many know God loves sickos? That's why I think God sent me a lot of people. I'll tell you, just a lot of people. 
Now, so what were they doing? They were offering to God all of these sacrifices, but guess what they mattered to God? Zero. When Jesus came in on Palm Sunday, they were saying Hosanna, which means God save us right here, but not right here. A lot of Hosannas up here. Hosanna, Hosanna, but nothing down here. Empty, gong show, baby. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 to 3. Amen? An acknowledgement of God. So what does God want? Acknowledge me. We just discovered how to acknowledge God. How to acknowledge God. What do you got to do? Believe he can raise the what? The dead. Acknowledge who you are. And then he says there to us, verse 6, rather than burnt offerings. Now, underline the word burnt offerings. Does your Bible have burnt offerings? Holocaust. A holocaust. All right, I was going to say right in there, holocaust. Mm -hmm. Now, what's a burnt offering? You offer your animal up, and here's a little sheep. Bah! Bah! They took a little needle, stuck it in the back of the neck. It dropped dead. Then, then the priest took the knife and went, and started emptying the entrails out. Mm. And then they, they started to get the mutton ready. It was tied down in three spots. You got it? And they looked like little triangles like this. You got it? And by the way, the triangles were called the horns. The horns of the altar. And then they lit a fire underneath and went... And then what happened to the smoke? It went up. Psalm 141 verse 2 says, the smoke appears to me. But God says, my nostrils are not receiving that. Because you're going through the motions. Mark chapter 7. And you're far from me. Amen? Uh, they burnt offerings. Verse 7. As at Adam, they have broken the covenant. Now, what's Adam? Anybody know what Adam is? What do you think it is? The land. The what? Land. The land. What happened at the land? The blood of... Um... Now, if you circle the word Adam, it was a place of wickedness. Yeah. Here's the Jordan River. And when you go upstream, there's a place called Adam. And what did they do there? Incredibly wicked. It was like a mini Sodom and Gomorrah. There was a lot of wicked places. Amen? So he says to us, verse number 7, As at Adam, they broke the covenant. Now, when you make a covenant, what was the covenant? The, to, well, it starts with marriage. How many think marriage is in disarray right now? Yes. Can I tell you, it's in disarray right now. Amen. Disarray. One of the NFL players just said, if, if, you, if he or she starts grumbling too much, divorce them. That was NFL advice. Okay. That is not Christian advice. Okay. So now notice that NFLers are getting into religion. That's great. Okay. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. So, Adam was a place of incredible wickedness and idolatry. Now what happens is, and Adam, when the water started flowing down in Joshua chapter 3, do you remember the water flowing down? Do you remember that the people had to cross the um, Jordan River? Do you remember when they had to cross from Shittim to Gilgal? When they started to cross the sea, the, the, the uh, Jordan River, the water stopped all the way up in front of Adam. Now do you understand the importance of Adam? Mm -hmm. What happened in Adam? That they would deal with it, but they didn't get the passage through to walk through because of their wickedness. Hmm. This is really deep, isn't it? Adam never had a covenant before. No, this is, this is a town. This is not the person Adam. This is the town, okay? Amen? Everybody see that? Please put a little note in your Bible there. This is not the person of Adam. This is a town. Adam. Adama. Which means what? From the ground. Brother Peter. From the ground. 
Are you getting this? This is not the person of Adam. Okay? This is, um, this is the town. They have broken the covenant. They were unfaithful to me there. Okay, now, so Adam, and you can read about that in Joshua chapter 3. Joshua 2, Joshua 3. When the waters start to split, and the waters are all the way back up to Adam. And the other town, I think, is Zebuim. All the way back there. And then the people could walk, because how many people were there? Two and a half million. So how many know you don't want a little road like this if there's two and a half million people? You want a not one and say, let's go. I wish I was leading the crowd. I get to have a lot of fun. And Peter would be there with his B&H camera taking a picture. Let's go. Amen. Can you just see all these people crossing? What a sight. And I'm convinced we're going to see that on God's DVD. Amen. You got the picture? Now, they're unfaithful there. Now, next, verse 8. Gilead is a city of evildoers. Boy, this is a lot of... Now, here's the Jordan River again. Here's Jerusalem over here. Here's the... Uh, do you want to see the Jordan River, ma'am? Oh. Here's the Jordan River. And then right over on the other side of the Jordan River is a place called Gilead. And they used to have bombs there where you can get healed. There is a bomb in Gilead. I know you want me to sing. To heal the sin sick soul. <laughs> here is Gilead. Up here on the top of the river is Adam. We travel all the way down. Here is Gilead. Amen? You got, you got the picture? And so what, what was Gilead? It's a city of evildoers staying with the footprints of blood. So what's going on in Gilead? It's supposed to be a center for healing, right? And what are they doing? No. Killing. Murder. Now, if you're writing there, it's a city of murder. You could write in there, who was the first murderer? Cain. Cain. So it's Cain-like. Genesis 4. It's Cain-like. So there's a lot of murder going on. Today in the news, there was more murder going on, right? That's all you hear on, on the news. Verse 9. As marauders lying in ambush for a victim, so do bands of priests. Now, how many know, again, the Lord saved the priest, amen? Amen. What do you mean, amen? You don't have to say it too loud. No. <laughs> <laughs> Clergy for 2,000 years, by and large, are not the best examples down to 2,000 years. Amen. You don't have to say amen, ma'am. <laughs> There's only one, one diocesan priest canonized, St. John the Vianney. Yes. That's it. Wow. You don't have to say it too loud. <laughs> wow. Well, you can be. When the there's a yeah, right. in two thousand years, when there's a spiritual renewal, it's never led by clergy. It's led by. It's led by the holy sisters. It's led by. It's not led by clergy. Right. Why? Because they're too. Hmm. <laughs> 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 you know why? Because I go to seminary, you don't. I know more about God than you do. So when you offer me your ridiculous religious practices, I just do. <sighs> Clergy are not doing well. Amen? We uh, know. Amen? So I found my cave. I, uh, we're looking, the, all the kids now have computers, the Chrome one. I'm really glad because I can do a lot of better Bible work with them. And we were looking at Patmos today, and one kid got all excited. Look, Father Bill, look. I said, what, what, what? The cave of the apocalypse. Yes. I went, oh. And he says, it's in the Agayan Sea. Aegean Sea. <laughs> So I, I, I do have to gently, I do have to gently guide them in their pronunciations. Okay, and the Agayans say, no, Aegean Sea. So we found Patmos, we found the cave. I said, ooh. 
and somebody says, I'm going there. Yeah. I'm telling my mother. Oh, no, he says, this kid, he says, I'll ask my mother if I can go there. Said, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going into the A, G, and C. I said, bring your B and H, baby. Bring your B and H. So, does everybody understand what's going on here? Yeah. Now, who gets another mention there? The pants of the priest. They murder on the road to Shechem. Ooh. Carrying out their wicked schemes. Now these are the people who collect money from you. These are the pictures who Peter takes B and H pictures of. And you get ten holy cards. And what are they doing? They're killing people. Now, what does Hosea 4 verse 6 say? Remember we just looked at that? What's the job of a priest? The most important thing for me outside celebrating the sacrament is to teach you. Amen. Amen. I want to pour everything I know in my mind and my heart about Jesus to you. I won't be satisfied till I do that. But I keep learning stuff every day, every day so I've got to pour out more stuff to you. Amen. Amen. So that's the role, is to instruct the faithful. What are these priests doing? They're killing people. They're killing people. I, I mean... Lord save us. Are, they, are they robbers? Like, yeah, yeah. Look like what happened. Yeah. on the way there. Now down there, I, I don't want to tell you this bad news. Shh, shh, shh. You want to hear the truth? Mm -hmm. When Constantine, I, I don't even want to tell you, I want to get your good news. When Con, there was ten persecutions of the church. The last persecution was called the Diocletian. It ended about 320. How many ever heard of St. Helena and, and all those people and everything else? Have you heard them? Mm -hmm. And they built the the big uh, places. Now, when that happens, guess what happened? The clergy took power. Guess when the first time we used the word clergy? Right? When Constantine took over. How many think that was scary? Yeah. So we said, I am clergy, and you are you. And guess what? You listen to me. Whoa. Whoa. Have you seen that down through the centuries? It was good and not so good. Amen. So right during that time, we called ourselves for the first time, after being persecuted for 300 years, clergy. Clergy. Whoa. And what did you think? Hello. Oh, your clerginess. I believe in honor and respecting the clergy. Amen. The bishops, the cardinal, I believe in honoring them. Amen. But what did we do? We lifted them so high. And guess what? Now, we look at them and go, oh, amen. But don't you ever treat Father Bill like that. Amen. <laughs> amen. Now, I have seen, look at verse 10. Everybody look at verse 10. I have seen a horrible thing in Israel. Where's Israel, everybody? The north. Put it in there a little north, okay? The, 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 the north is called the what? Israel. The south is called what? Judah. Okay, okay, very good. So everybody put it in there the north. I've seen in the north. Given to prostitution. Hello? All right, now, what are the number ones attack in the church? Homosexual, uh, homosexualism? Yes? Yeah. Um, attacking kids? Yes? Uh, and this needs to be addressed right away, right away. Prostitution is big. Prostitution is big. What else they need to address? Alcoholism. Amen? What do they need to do? The, the computer and the TV intake. Amen? Amen? Living high on the hog. Amen? In 1976, the Eucharistic Congress, there's a word at the Charismatic Conference, 40,000 were where the police pay. Did you ever hear, sir, where the police pay? Veterans stating, there was a word that went out from God, and the word was this, Oh, my clergy, you sicken me. Wow. Yeah. And here was the word. You drive around in your big black cars, and my people are starving to death. Woe are you. And guess who heard it? The cardinal, his name was Cardinal Kroll of Philadelphia. Mm. Whoa. Mm. Israel, so what did we learn? Ephraim is to give into prostitution. So now when we walk through Ephraim, it's the only solidly Christian town in the world. 
Basically, everybody in Ephraim is a Christian. Is that good? Yes. So Paul and I are going to retire. <laughs> but there's no water for him to swim around. He'll find. He'll, he'll go three miles to the pool of Siloam, float with water, and have Orca the killer whale attack him in the pool. <laughs> Amen. So now um, Israel is defiled. As for you, Judah, a harvest is appointed. You still got time. What year is this? 760. When is the temple going to be destroyed? Now, harvest in the Bible always means God's going to come to separate the sheep and the goats. So, this is a, spiritually speaking, Jesus speaks about a harvest. Whenever I restore the fortunes of my people, whenever I would heal Israel, the sins of Ephraim are exposed. We have to, right now, that's why I'm really grateful what's happened. The sins have got to be exposed. Amen. Now, please, does everybody have this underlined in your Bible? Everybody go in your Bible to Numbers 32, 23. Numbers 32, 23. Does everybody have that underline in your Bible? Do you, ma'am? No. Numbers 32, 23. Now, what does the Bible say? Right now we heard about the prosecutor coming to New Jersey. And by the way, just for your FYI, he's the guy that's doing the prosecution now starting in New Jersey. It just started. He's a, ready for this. He's a great Catholic. Oh, good. And guess what? He's out to clean house. Amen. And guess what? For the brothers who have done, the phone is ringing off the hook right now of the abuse going on. Does everybody know that? So guess what? Oh, don't get nervous. My life is so boring. I just go to my room and throw covers on my head. Amen. So I, I just, I just want. I told you, a bed. I, I got to check the Yankee score out, and when the second coming is coming, and that's it. <laughs> Amen. And keep the room cool in the summer, and keep it cooler in the winter. I always open my window. I got to get some air, and I can't breathe. And I'm just... So, so numbers. What does it say? Your sin will bind you. Please, I'm begging everybody here. You know about your present life and your past life. Anybody here 17 before in your life? Many of you had very colorful lives. Anybody here have a colorful life? You, ma'am, had a colorful life? You had a colorful life? Okay. So, did you ever have a colorful life, sir? No colorful lives. Okay. He lived a boring life. All right. I was too busy sewing. Now, in Luke chapter 12, in Luke chapter 12, verse 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, Jesus says, everything's going to be revealed. So how stupid can the clergy be thinking nobody's going to find out? Amen. How stupid can you think you're going to be moved along and it's going to be found out? They don't know the scriptures. They don't know the scriptures. No. They don't know. Everything you do in the dark is going to be revealed in the light. Amen? So now comes full exposure. Amen. And what happens to Ephraim, and, and we're going to take you there, and, and b &H cameraman here will take a thousand pictures, because he's never seen the area, so we've got to take a new spot. Okay. Whenever I heal, would heal Israel, now, what's the first way of healing? When we do our healing, uh, November 16th and 17th, we're going to have a healing mass at night, and then on the 17th, we're going to do deliverance, okay? Now, what we're going to do is we're going to go for you physically and emotionally, and you're all emotional wrecks anyway, and you're driving me nuts enough. <laughs> then we're going to go for you on the inside. Because you're all damaged. Amen? Everybody shake your head. Yes. yes. And we, we need this cleansing. Amen? Amen? Because I believe the time has come that I need to do this with you. Because you've got to be set free. Are you all coming on the, the 16th and the 17th? Amen? Yes. So, now, what's going to happen is you've got to be exposed on the inside. 
Don't get nervous. I'm not asking anybody to reveal what you did when you were 17. I don't want to hear it. You were wild. I know, you were really wild. So now, what's going to happen is, what did you do recently that you need to confess? Do you have to confess openly? No. Confess to God and be cleansed. Amen? Amen. Because you want to be cleansed on the inside. So this is what those hours are going to be about here. Amen? Good stuff? Good stuff. And we're, I'm going to have help from a wonderful gentleman. Uh, and the crimes of Samaria revealed. All right. Some say Samaria. Yeah, we've got, we've got to Hosea, yes. All right, our time is ticking out here. Good stuff? Chapter 7 of Hosea, verse number 1. Samaria. There's the crimes of Samaria. Now, what did Samaria do? I, 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 I do listen. By the way, I may close my eyes a little bit in church because I don't sleep very well. I hear every single word they say when they read it. Mm -hmm. And when they say, Oh, and the people from Samaria. <laughs> <laughs> and I have this image uh. of these Japanese ninjas. <laughs> I, I see their little I, I see their little sticks to them. <laughs> Samurai. Samurai. Now, what's the sin of Samurai? Very good. You're getting an A. You might redeem yourself yet. <laughs> 2 Kings 17. Very good. You're going to start in 2 Kings 17. Everybody go to 2 Kings 17. How many like studying the Bible? This is really studying it. Mm -hmm. Jesus said to the Samaritan woman, and if you pray hard enough, we, it's right now. It's off. It's, it's it's off our trip to go to see that because they throw stones at the bus. If they do, I'll sacrifice Pat and put her out, <laughs> and we'll say Pat, if we can, we'll pick you up at the end of the trip. All right. Now. If I'm still alive. Now, in Samaria, remember when Jesus said, "You have five husbands." Yes. Yeah. Does everybody want to know the names of them? There they are. Look at 2 Kings 17. Everybody with me in 2 Kings 17? Look at all the names of the five husbands. Marduk, Nerva, Mishnah. What verse? All right, what verse? Verse uh, Avon. Verse 29. All right, these are the five husbands that Jesus spoke about. Remember with the Samaritan? Yes. And so what was Jesus doing at the well? Oh, we want to get to that well. I want to see that. I have never seen that well. So here's what Peter's going to do. He's going to dress up with the sheiks, the sheikhs, and the shooks. I'm going to put all this um, uh, Arabian gear on him. And he's going to sneak in to take a picture with his B&H and take the pictures of the well for me. It's still the same well that Jesus got proposed. It's still there. It's still there. Very well. Okay, we're going to try to get in there. Uh, we've got to monitor it day by day to see what's going on there. Because they just pelted a bus with rocks. Mm -hmm. And it broke one of the windows. Oh. And uh, with Pat sitting by the window, I don't want her to get scared. Okay? So, what happened at Samaria? Look at right there. Everybody see the five gods? Yes. Verse 29? 30. 30. 30. Everybody see all the... These are the five... You could write in there. The five husbands that Jesus was referring to. You're the only ones on your block that know that. Is that interesting, the five husbands? Mm -hmm. Are you there? 2 Kings 17, verse 29, 30. Verse 30. 2 Kings. Babylon conquered Israel. Everybody see them? Now you're the only ones on your block that know the names of the five husbands of Fotina. Her name, according to a tradition, is Fotina. P H O T I N A. Fotina. Jesus had to go to Samaria. <laughs> the second thing about Samaria, Samaria, 
Number one, those are the those are the gods. I wasn't thinking that until Avon mentioned that, and that's very good. You're getting an A today, Avon. Here's, here's the second thing I want to say about Samaria. The reference to Samaria is when the enemy is going to come in in 722 BC, they're going to take over Samaria. The enemy is going to force themselves upon the women. Sound familiar today? Mm -hmm. And the name of the enemy coming in is Aram. A-R-A-M. Jesus speaks a language called Aramaic. There are four incidences in the Gospel of Mark where you hear Abba, Talitha Kumi, Ephatha, Eloi, Eloi, Laba Sabachthani. Do you remember those times? Those are Aramaic words that St. Mark, by the way, St. Peter was dictating to him, said, keep those words in there, in the original lingo of the day. And they, they had to take uh, uh, the Berlitz School of Languages course. So what's another thing about Samaria? It was mixed religion. What did they, the Samarians do to this very day? We're going to leave Pat as a sacrificial offering. <laughs> uh, we, to this very day, they hate the Jews in Jerusalem. Oh, wow. Do they consider themselves Jew Jews? Yes, mm. the true Jews. But they only believe in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They don't like Hosea because it speaks bad about oh. them. Yes. So when, when we send when we send when we send Pat to the top, and Pat's going to say, "Oh, I learned about you guys and Hosea." You're really bad. Okay. So what's going to happen as the bus takes off? Pat is still talking to us. Pat will be stoned to death. All right. And don't get nervous. I will go and have a funeral mass for Pat right away. And because right after that, we're going to Nain. Okay, so where Jesus raised the dead. So, when you talk to Samaritans, when we go there, if God opens the door, if it's calm, when we go to Samaria with the Japanese ninjas, when we go there, it's a place where they believe they are the true Jews. Are they? No. But don't tell them that. <laughs> Just smile at them. And Peter says, Just smile. B and H. My new B and H camera. Picture. I want to take a picture of you. I go to Dunkin' Donuts. I want to show everybody the picture. Smile. Amen? Are, are, are you getting this? So do you understand why he mentioned Samaria? Samaria, put a big note there, is always, always, in the prophets, mentioned in a bad light. Hmm. Always. Hmm. Always. And if we don't go there, you will drive in the bus, and the guide will say, we could, we're going to leave Pat off at Samaria, <laughs> and we will continue. And then right behind Samaria is Mount Tabor. Okay, you, you got the picture? You got why he's saying Samaria? Now, these are pretty bad happenings. You got Adam. Yes. Not, you got, you got uh, Ephraim, his prostitution breaking out. Gilead, where the bomb used to be. You got Shechem, where the, where the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant used to be, with Eli and his sons. And they were womanizing. Amen. I have a friend of mine who just went into a new order in the church called the Fathers of the Holy Spirit out of Phoenix, Arizona. Not that Phoenix, Arizona. And they're doing it right. He has to pray minimally in the morning, three hours. How many know if you pray three hours of a day, you're going to look better than this? Amen. Amen. So I always think of him. I said, I think I should get on the plane and join, go to Phoenix, okay? But you know what they have there? Snakes. Oh. <laughs> Lions and tigers. Good oh. hey, stuff. Everybody understand Samaria? Okay, look at verse 1. And the crimes of Samaria revealed. 
because of, so we see idolatry, what happened, we see womenizing, we see raping, we see forced people to, um, to uh, and we see that also, remember, with uh, China and Japan and forcing the women into slavery there, and terrible crimes have committed, amen? And even uh, uh, reality stars on TV, they're just accused of something today. Isn't this getting interesting? <laughs> so far, so far, now. <laughs> Chapter 7, as we begin to wrap up here. Good stuff? Good stuff. They practice deceit. Thieves break into houses. Now, the more you commit sin, the more you have to try to protect yourself. The more there's sin, you have are filled with fear. Your sin. The more you commit sin and live in sin, you get afraid a whole lot more mm. and you've got to protect yourself mm. because you think someone's going to do this to you, something's yeah. going to happen to you. Mm -hmm. So you have to set up, and guess what happens? Thieves come in. Now, let's go fast forward into the book of Thessalonians. Uh, I'll tell you where it is, you don't have to turn there. First Thessalonians 5, when, when Paul describes the end of times, he said, thieves break in. Well, now you know what he means, that thieves break in. I'm not following God. And so what happens when I don't follow God? I've got to watch my back all the time. Right. Now, so how many know I don't have to watch my back right now? Mm -hmm. i got angels around me. And you know what? I walk through the town and I said, make my day. <laughs> <laughs> Amen? Yeah. Amen? So, now you understand, First Thessalonians 5, when the thieves come in, now, how many ever heard of Armageddon? In Revelation 16, when Revelation is again introduced to us uh, of the Armageddon, guess what happens? The thieves will break in. When you don't live a life in Jesus Christ, thieves are breaking into you. Amen? Amen. Are you, you getting all this? So true. So you can see there, look at verse, verse 1. Bandits rob in the streets, verse 2, but they do not realize that I remember all their evil deeds. Underline that. Now, God remembers what you've done. So guess what all these sins are? They're unconfessed. Mm -hmm. I remember everything you've done. Now, Hebrews 8.12, when you confess your sins, they're what? Gone. 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 But guess what? Are they confessing their sins? No. no. They remember. Think of all the people you're trying to bring to Christ right now. You know what's a scary thought for all those people you're trying to bring to Christ? Every one of them, God remembers their sins right now. How many know that's absolutely frightening? How many would like God to remember all the sins of our lives? No. How many are grateful when you're a Christian, God doesn't remember any of them? But I'll be right back. <laughs> the kids are telling me to do the floor. Okay. One, one day there was a teacher singing with the kids on the stage and the kids are singing and I'm in the back on. And the, kids, yeah. and the teacher turns around. Poor kids. That teacher watches. I'm a bad teacher. Amen. So, so she turned around and they're going. <laughs> and, <laughs> and she turns around like. <laughs> Amen. So the thieves are breaking in. And I really feel for every single person that doesn't have a personal relationship with Jesus, their sins are remembered right now. Whoa. Whoa, baby. Whoa. The sins engulf them. Look at verse 7, verse 2. They're always before me. Whoa, they're always before God. How many would like to have all of your sins before God right now? Okay, if you underline that. This is every unredeemed person has all their sins before the Almighty. Oh, baby. They delight, verse 3, they delight the king with their wickedness, the princess with their lies. Now, how many ever heard of my friend John the Baptist? Yeah. I've been studying him again. I always study. And I always like, do you know John preached in, in, in the water for one year? When we go to Israel, and Pat's still in Samaria. <laughs> I, I will show you. 
Um, but we're going to have a night vigil on Mount Zion. Yes. A candlelight. Yes. And I'm, we're, uh, hopefully through the, the twinkling of the night, I want to show you where the Macarius prison is, where John was. Okay? So I'm going to point it out to you where the, where the prison was. Here's the Dead Sea, where Irma was swimming and getting all gook all over her <laughs> with the water and the bubbles. It's fine. And right on the other side, of that, you see Jordan, right over there in the corner is where John the Baptist was in prison. And in that courtyard, in that courtyard, that's where the Hootsie Tootsies came out, Salome. Doo -doo -doo. By the way, her name is mentioned by a man called Josephus. They, I could show you the court, what it looked like. That's where he swore and he was drinking, amen? So brothers and sisters, they're princes with their lies. They're all adulterers, burning like an oven. Malachi chapter 3, whose fire the baker need not stir because there's plenty of what? Fire. <laughs> From the netting on the dough till it rises. On the day of the festival of our king, the princes become inflamed with wine. Does this sound familiar? That sounds like Herod. Mm. Here's another thing I just learned. In the time of the Bible, when Jesus was born, how many know there's like four Herods? Everybody's named Herod. Please do not name your children Herod or your grandchildren. Skip that one. But I discovered something that Herod was not his first name. Herod was a title like president. So Herod Antipas, okay? Herod Agrippa. So these were all names calling them like president. So Herod became, I never knew that. I'm studying the Bible my whole life, I never knew that. So Herod became a title. So what were they doing? Filled with wine. Mm -hmm. And what was he doing when Salome was doing the Hootsie Tootsie act? I swear to you, my dear, anything you want, half my kingdom. And Mrs. Herod was going, oh, oh, the head, give me the head of John the Baptist. I want the head on a silver platter. We're just about done. He joins his hands with mockers. Right now we're living in a tremendous day of mocking. Now put next to mocking there, mocking always brings forth the apostasy. Mm. What's the apostasy? People raised in the faith and depart from it. How many know at least 20 people that walked away from God in your family and friends? Anybody know at least 20? That's probably a very under number, isn't it? We probably need 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. They just walked away. That's the apostasy. And now, when you talk to them, they have a mocking spirit, mm -hmm. don't they? Yeah. Very, very mocking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I see it in, I hear it in my family, a mocking yeah. spirit. So true. We will continue. Mm -hmm. Now, Father Tom asked me to go months ago to do a healing mass in Phillipsburg, which is the other side of the world. <laughs> so he said, I said it, and I said, it's really not a good night for me. Oh, you told me, you told me. Uh -oh. So I won't be with you next Wednesday to drive to the other side of the world, St. James in Phillipsburg. The week after that, I'll be taking a little mini break. So we won't be here till three weeks from tonight, right? You got that? So what date is that? The 10th of October. So would you please put down the 10th of October. We will resume at the, and there should be no more falls out till the end of the year. Now, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be doing lots of celebrations. Uh, I need to know, um, everybody write down the 16th and 17th? Yes. Okay. If you're coming, would you kind of let us know so we can plan? Do we want lunch or do you want to bring your own lunch? If, if we want lunch, we can charge people $10 each and Phil will bring everybody a lunch, amen? From Circle Pizza or something mm -hmm. like that. So we, we kind of got need to know, I, I'm expecting about 100 people to come, amen, or more, and that will help me get the information out. There will be more conferences coming up. We're gonna be offering you lots of activity here at St. Matthew's, amen? Are you excited? All right, you're gonna see in bulletin, you're gonna see Charles giving a talk. Um, <laughs> We will, we will be doing lots of activities. If you see something you would like us to do, throw it out to me and we'll do it. We're gonna get the church really alive here, okay? 
There'll be Life in the Spirit seminar coming up. There'll be a lot of great things happening. All right, amen. Yes, sir. Question. Question. You need to walk with God in life, you must go to church on Sunday. Absolutely. If you do not go to church on Sunday, you are disobeying Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. Do not forsake the assembly of believers. So when they said they're not going to church, they're committing a sin. Amen. 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 I work with the kids, and I know it's not all their faults. They're not going. They're not. And one kid says, I haven't been there in eight, eight months. So I, 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 you're not driving. Amen. So, so everybody write down October 10th, okay? Now, we're, we're, now on October 13th, we're going to have upstairs, we're going to have a cynical, and we're going to have a candlelight procession. It's Our Lady of Fatima Day, okay? And we're going to march all the way out to Charles' house, and uh, we're going to light the candle right in front of his wife and everything. Else. So, um, so there will be a candlelight procession here October 13th, okay? You got that? Amen? Then we'll be do offering stuff in November, and we'll be doing uh, True to Women's coming up. Um, Miss Kathy didn't tell me which one she wants yet, okay? So uh, we'll, we'll be doing lots of novenas. We're, 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 we're going to gather in the church, okay? We're going to do lots of great things. Amen? Amen. Good stuff? Good stuff? Okay, now this, this week I'll be in Staten Island on Friday, so you're all welcome to come. We're going to be in Brooklyn, New York on the 29th. Uh, in a place called the Resurrection from 10 to 4 and uh, we'll be doing days of preaching and teaching so you're most welcome to come tu vas a venir señora y yo estoy anunciando ahora mismo y mira David ok so these are all the conferences and um, we're going to do a one day conference in Philadelphia on a, I think it's the 20th. They still, I, I still haven't heard from them. All right, good stuff. Everybody, please mark down. I apologize. I really don't want to miss one. I love being with you all the time, but this priest uh, is annoying me. He said, you said I'm coming. He said, and it's Wednesday. I said, make it a different night. So I'm going all the way to the other side of the world. Phillipsburg. It's right by Easton, Pennsylvania. So uh, we'll be there. And uh, anybody got any questions? Yes. The 16th is mass at stairs at seven and nine to four on Saturday. Okay. Now there there is for those who are coming to the conference on the 16th and 17th. There is a book called Unbound. Did you have a copy of them? Uh, there is a book, it's about $15. It is a powerful little book. There's thousands that have gone all over the world. Would you like me to order you one of those books? Yes. It's how yes. to get delivered. Yes. Okay, yes. has the Korean community got that? Okay, I think the Korean community needs, if I spoke Korean, I would do a, a conference for them in Korea. I only got three sentences down. That's all I can do right now. But with, with you teaching me, I'll, I'll get to four by next week. Okay. Good stuff? Does everybody have a personal relationship with Jesus? Yes. Now, are you signed up for Israel? Yes. Did David pay your way? Yay. His eyes just went toward God. Okay. So, so let's come before the Lord. And uh, good stuff tonight? Good stuff. You got a lot of background? It's very rich, isn't it? Yeah. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Holy God, Mighty God, Immortal God, renew us and restore us. And Jose really points out, we need to turn from our sins of the past to you, the living God. Please, Lord, in these days that lie ahead with such darkness around us, help us to be honest with our lives and continue to be men and women of purity and integrity in the life of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Don't forget to look up us online, God's Word Alive Today.